Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Saturday, the 7th of October. Now, yesterday we had what I can only call the privilege of having a long, detailed interview with Professor Angus uh, Dalgleish. And I know many of you have watched it, but there's no two ways about it. It was long and complicated. But in my view, it contains some absolute gems that are vital for our health. So I'm going to do a short summary of the first part of his video as simply as I can manage to explain it as I understand the material he gave us. Now, Professor Dalgleish is, is a MD, that's a research degree, that's like a, above a normal medical degree, is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Australia and in England. Now, if you go to a hospital, the consultant you'll see will probably be a member of the Royal College of Physicians, so Professor Dalgleish is the one above that, is a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists and a fellow of Medical Sciences. Quite incredible achievement, very senior researcher. In fact, uh, I'm pretty sure he's the most qualified doctor I've ever talked to. Well published uh, as well, of course, after a lifetime of research. Now, the interview started off with him confirming my theories about vitamin D, which I was rather pleased about. I wasn't expecting that, but he mentioned that. He said, he said vitamin D deficiency is endemic. It's all over the place in the UK. And if vitamin D status is improved, immunotherapy also improves in his cancer patients. So that, that was useful. But the main point he mentioned was that he's been looking after patients with malignant melanoma. Now, most of you will probably know this is a, this is a skin cancer affecting the melanocytes. Uh, and the thing about melanoma, very often you get an irregular shaped lump on the surface of the skin, very often with different pigments in it. This is why we have to be very skin aware and go and see skin specialists if we suspect we may have this and get it cut out early because it metastasizes very aggressively and at a very early stage. So malignant melanoma is dangerous because it's a very early metastasizer. Anyway, he's been treating patients with this and because he's a really clever cancer doctor, he's kept some patients stable for up to 20 years who've got this malignant condition. He's kept them on an even keel, kept them alive. And he's found that melanomas are often activated after extreme stress like divorce or bankruptcy or, or bereavement. It can, it can bring it back again. But now he's seeing more of his melanoma patients relapsing. In other words, the disease is going from being quiet in remission to being active and malignantly malignant again and spreading around the body. He's seeing these patients relapse sometimes after 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But these patients did not have traumas, as typically he has seen over his career. But they all reported that they were up to date with their COVID boosters. And so we started putting these two things together as a something worth thinking about. So in the group getting melanoma relapses, all mentioned they were up to date with their COVID boosters, all of them. Could it be that boosters were leading to the relapse? Now, that's a perfectly legitimate scientific question. There's a correlation here. Is that correlation causal? Now, gets really interesting now. So after 30 years of vaccine work and researching on vaccines, he thinks that when you're doing vaccine research, the overall focus that is on antibodies all the time. We saw this in the COVID pandemic. Oh, antibodies, antibodies, antibodies. He thinks that's not the most important thing. The most important thing in immunity that we should be looking for is the T-cell response. So the T cells are the small lymphocytes type of the white uh, blood cells. There's B lymphocytes and there's T lymphocytes. The, uh, the, the T lymphocytes, there's T cytotoxic cells. And what these T cytotoxic cells do is they kill cancer cells. If they recognize it as a cancer cell, they will kill it. They will eradicate it. If the T cells are active and are able to recognize it, they will kill the cancer cells. So we probably, most of us get cancer, certainly at my age, we probably get cancer every day. But... God willing, I haven't been diagnosed with cancer because the T cells kill it. They keep on top of it. And T cells will also kill virally infected cells as well. They'll just eradicate the whole cell, killing all the virus. So why are we focusing on antibodies all the time when the T cells are probably more important is the point that Professor Dalgleish was making. Now, innate T cell activity goes down after the age of 55 and he said, it's a medical expression, uh, medical detailed expression, but we all use it. It's called in your boots by the time you're 70. So if, if it's in your boots, that means it's, it's very low. 
So T cell activity goes down over the age of 55. By the time you get to the age of 70, T cell activity is very, very low indeed. Of course, this is exactly the time when cancers become more common. So T cell activity goes down in an exactly proportionate, inverse proportionate way, uh, cancers go up. And Professor Dalgleish clearly believes there's a relationship between these two. As T cell function goes down, cancers increase. So, he reasons, does the decline in, in innate T cell activity cause the increase in cancers? And the answer to this is probably yes. As we age, T cell activity goes down, cancers go up. So he thought, well, why don't we just boost the innate immune system? Obviously. So if these T cells are getting a bit laxed, a bit sloppy on the job, well, let's give them a bit of a boost. So he's developed a heat-killed microbacterium vaccine. So it's just some microbacterium that he's developed. He's optimised the strain, um, cooks them up, kills them, and then injects them. This is not an mRNA vaccine. It is not generating an antibody response. It is boosting the natural T cell response. And because you boost the natural T cell response, it means the vaccine doesn't just work against one disease, like a flu vac. It doesn't do much any well. I'm not going to comment on flu vacs. But it's not, it's, even if a flu vac was working fantastically and perfectly and brilliantly, it's only working against influenza. If you have a, a measles vaccine, that's only working against measles. So these are all single activity, basically. OK, there is some immune crossover, but they're basically single activity vaccines. Whereas here we've got one vaccine that could work against a whole range of conditions and potentially a whole range of cancers because it's boosting the innate immune response, which we know protects us against viral infections, bacterial infections and cancers. But it's just one injection. So one injection, yeah, OK, you might you might sell a few, but um, obviously... Um, Companies could make more by selling multiple injections rather than just one coverall injection. Not that that's anything to do with it, of course. That's just me uh, musing out loud. So he's developed this heat-killed microbacterium to boost the immune system. Now, if you keep ki giving killed microbacterium, these, this new uh, injection is developed, this new vaccine is developed, not an mRNA vaccine, just dead bacteria to boost the T-cell response. Now, if you keep giving this microbacterium injection, it does not boost the antibodies. So we don't get a boost in antibodies, but we get a boost in the T cells. And he's proved this experimentally. We get a boost in the T cell activity. Broad spectrum immunity. What's not to love here? Also seems to protect colds and flu by boosting immune response. So he's got some of his melanoma patients on this on this mycobacterium to boost the immune system to um, mean that the, the T cells are active and it's the T cells that keep the melanoma down. But these patients also seem to stop getting colds and flu every winter, which is a rather pleasant side effect. Not an adverse reaction, a side effect. They don't seem to get these infections anymore. Pretty wonderful. And Professor Dalgleish predicted this would be a good frontline treatment for covid so while everyone was teasing about getting a new mRNA vaccine, it looks like there was one sitting on the shelf all the time. But of course, it was just one vaccine. And uh, it wasn't, uh, as far as I know, the proprietary rights to that vaccine weren't owned by certain vaccine manufacturers which have come to prominence, as, as far as I'm aware. So Professor Dalgleish predicted this would be a good frontline treatment for covid now, at the height of the first wave, Pop might remember that, 2020, the, the height of the COVID wave in 2020, um, he had quite a few patients on this mycobacterium uh, vaccine for, he, for um, keeping their melanomas in check, which he's done so brilliantly over these decades. Very impressive to keep that disease. And I've seen people with, with, with malignant melanoma, they just die within months. Terrible, often young people, quite, quite, quite terrible disease. So at the height of the first wave, none of the patients on, uh, on the microbacterium vaccine to keep their, um, to keep their uh, melanoma down, none of them got COVID, or at least none of them were sick. Whereas the staff, young, fit, healthy people were getting COVID and getting sick all around them. So these patients that were often older and often vulnerable um, because they have a stage four melanoma, they didn't get sick. So... Suggestive evidence that this mycobacterium, cheap, readily available 
probably not even patentable vaccine, was preventing COVID, but no one was interested. Staff were getting ill, but the patients were not. Now, he went on to say, Professor Dalglish said, in general, if you need to give more than two shots of a vaccine, it doesn't work. Now, vaccines should be given to people with known immune status, he says. I'm just coming back to that point in a minute about more than two doses. But he says vaccines should be given to people with known immune status. So if you're going to give someone a vaccine, you should know if they're already immune to that disease. It's not a one size fits all. We should know if they're already immune to that disease or not. And of course, (laughs) virtually no one was tested prior to being vaccinated to see if they needed it or not. But if you don't need a vaccine, it will make things worse. Now, what he said here, if you need more than two shots to make it work, um, that what he's saying is you only have a limited capacity in your immune system. So the immune system can only do so much work in a particular period of time. You've only got one immune system per human being. And he says, if you boost the immune system with another vaccine to harness half of the immune system to make antibodies, then half of the immune system is flat out making antibodies. I mean, half is a kind of a descriptive term rather than a physiological measurement. But half of your immune system is making antibodies as a result of the new in this case, booster COVID vaccine that you've given. Well, if it's busy making antibodies, it can't be doing other things, can it? That's his reasoning. So if you boost with a vaccine to harness half of the immune system to make antibodies to a virus, but he also pointed out that the vaccine is to a particular type of virus which no longer exists on the surface of the planet because, of course, the virus has evolved and moved on. But if you do that, you're going to weaken the immune system because the, the immune system is busy, busy making antibodies, which are, if not useless, of very limited use when the immune system could be doing something really useful, like fighting cancers or fighting other infections. Now, this weakening of the immune system has been confirmed by science, because if you give the first two injections, you, uh, you make immunoglobulin type uh, G type 1 and immunoglobulin uh, G type 3. Now these are called neutralizing antibodies so these will block up the uh, the active site on the virus. But if you give a booster you change from making as much Ig1 and Ig3, the useful neutralizing antibodies, to making Ig4 which is a regulatory or even suppressing antibody. So we can actually suppress the immune system and Professor Clancy has told us that repeated vaccine can stimulate the production of suppressor cells which actually damp down the immune system so interesting that the research from australia uh, both leading professors and the research from the uk is in perfect agreement so boosters he also suppress the t-cell response so booster vaccines will make antibodies which are pretty well useless but will suppress the t-cell response what is it that's keeping the melanomas down well it's the t-cells So if you give a vaccine that suppresses the T-cell response, what's going to keep the melanomas down? Well, the answer is nothing. Now, we don't know how true this is, but it all makes perfect theoretical sense. So we need to get T-cells boosted, not be suppressing our T-cells. We don't want Ig4. We don't want suppressed T-cells. So why are we giving boosters would be Professor Dalglish's uh, contention. And uh, T-cells are protecting us against a wide range of other Uh, diseases as uh, well infections t-cell t-cell response crashes after the boosters in cancer patients now he's monitored this in some patients what he said he said t-cell response crashes after the booster in cancer patients not in all of them but in many of them but of course if you're one of the ones where it does crash then the consequences could be well yeah obvious t-cells control melanoma keep the melanoma down. Relapse only occurred when there was T-cell perturbation. So this messes up the T-cells and uh, the boosters cause this perturbation and uh, therefore there could be the reactivation of the melanoma. So we have the combination of his empirical um, findings. There's a perfect scientific mechanism for why this could be true This needs to be duplicated all over the country. This is a matter of urgent research that needs done. And there is other possibilities from other oncologists he's been talking to of other cancers 
uh, mentioned were lymphoma, potentially um, leukemia, um, uh, the, the cancer that affects the uh, the the, uh, the B, B cells. Um, the name escapes me, but anyway, there's several blood related cancers and possibly other cancers such as uh, colon cancer. And later in the video, I'm not going to do it now because it wasn't in this first part, but he did talk about explosive cancers, which is quite frightening. So I didn't want to waste any of that medicine. That is absolutely, as far as I can see, brilliant medical observation, followed up by really sound, as I understand it, as I understand Professor Dalglish's teaching, um, very sound uh, pathophysiological research and uh, understanding. And that was just the first 11 minutes of the video. I just didn't want to waste that. It's just such good stuff. Um, you won't get this from the textbooks. It's you know, absolutely cutting-edge research. So thank you, Professor Dalglish. Thank you for listening, and we'll do a bit more of that later. That was just the first 11 minutes of this pretty staggering uh, video. Thank you for watching. <laughs>